Okay. Um, where is uh, the topic? Okay, I have to go to my email. Comprehensive teaching networks. We start. So maybe people can keep be quiet. Good afternoon, everyone. I have. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Oh, it's as loud as can be. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, okay, hello, Molly's. So, can you please ask them to? Oh, only one at the same. Okay. So, all right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Irene Mbari Kirika, and welcome to uh, this afternoon's session. We are going to focus on Sub Saharan Africa. We are going to meet some great speakers who are going to share with us their experience implementing programs for children with disabilities in the education space, including employment. Um, as we all know, Africa has many countries. And uh, the best part about it is that the experience from Nigeria can be very a very different experience when you come to Kenya. So um, to start off, I will int briefly introduce the team. We are going to start off with Gilbert uh, Ruturusta. Uh, and Gilbert will take us to the Democratic Republic of Congo. He made sure I say that and not Congo because they are two different countries. So it will be interesting to learn more from him on what they are doing in education programs. And then we'll go to Ife. Ife is from Nigeria and she will share the same on some of the work they are doing in, in uh, emergency settings with children with disabilities and transitional learning centers. And then we'll go to Kenya. And in Kenya, we have Suparna and Maxwell. And they'll share with us the work they are doing at Kilimanjaro uh, blind trust, especially when it comes to students with visual impairments. And then finally, we'll come back to Austria and then Johannes will walk us through some of the work they're doing here in Austria. So as I said before, my name is Irene Barikurika and I'm the founder and executive director of Enable. Enable is a nonprofit organization that uh, is based in Washington, D.C. and Nairobi, Kenya. And we started as a simple idea to see how we can help students who are blind have access to technology and skills training. It's a very complex project, but not very complicated to implement or to scale. And we started off with 100 blind students setting up assistive technology programs in schools for the blind. Today, we're in, school, we're in six schools for the blind. We've been there since 2009. And uh, what you'll find is we've had more than 14,000 students go through our program. But what's even more exciting is that some of those students who are part of our program, they've come back and they've become assistive technology instructors. So they're the ones who are teaching other blind students digital skills. This is really, really important because how a blind child learns how to read and write or how to use technology is very critical. And through the process, we've learned a lot. So that's a bit about my background, but I want to go ahead and hand over to Gilbert to introduce himself and then go from there. Thank you, Ms. Irena. I am going to present you to Nafasi. A community-based rehabilitation program, very innovative in so challenging contexts like DRC Congo. To improve living condition of children and youth with disability. I am Mr. Gilbert Mututsi, as I say, from Congo, Africa. DRC Congo is a country situated in Central Africa, working with ADED, a child focused organization. Coming back to DRC context, 
the country is in a fragile context, no fix and no clear statistic of person with disability, no clear plan and budget allocation from state, but disability inclusion policy are in place. The goal of our program is to improve socioeconomic condition of children with disability and youth through education and employment. Some pathway of the program have already deployed, including pushing government to be more accountable, empowering education actor to be more involved, and fighting against negative social norm against disability. The program has been inspired from Karuna Foundation Nepal. It aims to embed the program within state and community structure with state and community contribution. Then it becomes somehow dif difficult because I start say, saying that there is a uh, uh, Congo is challenging context. We try to integrate the program within existing school and professional training, as a health service providers. It is a multi-stakeholder program. We use those community and state structure for two reasons. First one, we want to be cost effective and we want at the beginning sustainability of the program. Kunafasi program is innovative because of the two aspects of embedment, integrating the program within state policies and community policies with state and community contribution. We facilitate the implementation of the program in the way of even the external fund is ended, the program can continue alone. The two aspects are very important to us, and that's why we strongly believe on state contribution, even the, the context of the country is challenging. The program has been is so innovative because we want one day, even now we are pushing, but we believe one, one day the program have to be owned by state and implemented by state, then our role as NGO become to support state and to strengthening services to help children with disability and youth sustainability. Even the program is, I lose something, I think I use this. Even the program is very young, but we has already some tangible result. We have in three, in two, in four hours, four years, we have increased attendance of children with disability from five to six, nine. We, young people who follow training are self or WEG employed. Community-based facilitators who do not exist in the Congo context now are doing, are recognized, paid by state, and are doing a lot of work in the community. Some lesson learned is that without collaboration, without referencing, 
the community-based rehabilitation is weak, even impossible. We want in the future, in the, in the coming future, to work on the five pillars of quality and inclusive education, improving school and professional learning environment, teaching, learning, parent involvement, and school management. We want to integrate digital to help and to reach more educational outcomes. We believe with education, through education, person with disability can be seen as an asset than a burden, which is a reality today. Thank you for all you. Thank you for all. Oh, fantastic. Uh, thank you so much, Gilbert. That was quick. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so there's something interesting you said. I think for those of us who are in the nonprofit space, you always get this question, what is your government doing? Um, based on the work that you're doing, I get that question all the time. But I think he explained it well. Sometimes the government doesn't come first. Sometimes you have to create a sample project, show them how it can be done, and then bring them on board. So a good example, Enable is a partner to the Ministry of Education in Kenya, so we work together. But if you go to a country and expect a government to be showing you how children with disabilities use technology in Africa, that's a dream. But if you have a good sample, you can actually work together collaboratively. You bring them in once you have something to show them, and you'll find that most governments are very receptive. So thank you so much for bringing that out. Thank you so much. Yeah, fantastic. So my next one will go to, I think we will go to Nigeria and we'll hand over to Ife. Hello everybody. Um, I bring you warm greetings from Nigeria, from our transitional, transitional learning centers. Uh, it's an honor to be here to receive this award and also to be able to present uh, the work that we do in Nigeria through our transitional learning centers. Um, greetings to all the participants and also to those online as well. Um, so this year's uh, theme of inclusive education is very apt for us at Maple Leaf Early Years Foundation because it is a strategy that we have used um, that transforms our learning environment, both formal and informal. And because we work in displaced settings, uh, it is imperative to accommodate all children, regardless of their physical, intellectual, social, emotional, linguistic, or other, uh, or other conditions. Educational interventions already are very limited in displaced settings, and so inclusive an inclusive environment is really very imperative. Due to their circumstances and because of their related trauma, in our work we have seen firsthand how an inclusive environment helps the healing process, especially through psychosocial supports, and being around other children whose abilities may differ from theirs makes a significant impact on their journey of self-reliance and recovery in a lot of cases. Our aim has always been to create a holistic and safe learning space for children who feel different because of their disability and this gives them an opportunity to fit in despite that disability. We make every effort to ensure that our program is not only inclusive, but also very holistic. So every child in the displaced settings where we work, where we run our programs, is afforded the opportunity to be a part of the program, irrespective of their disabilities or their lack of any disabilities. We also extend this inclusivity to our staff as well. Our staff who have disabilities are encouraged to share their stories with the children, and it is inspiring for the children to see that disabilities do not need to hinder their capabilities. So different components enrich 
the programs that we run for the beneficiaries, including the we have an early childhood development program. We have a psychosocial supports program and we have a school feeding program as well included in uh, the programs that we run. And we also have an agri vocational skills program. And this program in particular is highly encouraging and participatory because this age group addresses youth who have shown signs of trauma and as a result have learning and psychosocial disabilities. So this program keeps them very engaged, giving them a feeling of self-worth and also increases their knowledge of their capabilities. So we have a child, just for an example, a story, one of our stories, um, Abdul. He was a happy eight year old in one of our centers. And during the uh, holiday in 2022, while just being a child climbing trees, fell and injured his spine, rendering him unable to walk. So for a year, he underwent a series of local medical interventions until the Honorable Commissioner for the National Commission for Refugees, Migrants and IDPs intervened and he got further medical care and a wheelchair. But after missing school for a year and losing all hopes of fulfilling his dreams of wanting to become a surgeon, he returned to the center. But Abdul returned with a lot of trauma. Uh, for he had been in school as a healthy child, walking, playing and running with other children, and he came back different. However, with the support of our psychosocial team and our committed teachers, and also with the children in the center, smiles returned to Abdul's face. Within a week, the little boy who returned malnourished, depressed, and discouraged began to light up the center with his resilience and his sheer will to thrive and succeed in school. We have other success stories, but because of time, we won't be able to run through all those stories. But we also have Mariam, who joined our center when she was four years old. And according to her father, she was born with a natural mental disability. Mariam exhibited a lot of challenges. She because of her limited communication skills, Mariam was very withdrawn. However, when we discovered that whenever she goes home, she would teach her mother everything she learned at the center. So leveraging on that, uh, the teachers saw the, you know, incorporated our social emotional uh, learning into uh, their programs. And she was, she began to open up and began to uh, communicate with her teachers. So these success stories, uh, we also have Musa'ab, whose story is also one of uh, resilience through the power of inclusion. At five years old, traumatized by the insurgencies of Boko Haram, he suffered a lot of loss and sometimes neglect. But Musa'ab, because of those things, was very angry um, and very aggressive, believing this was the way his life was meant to be. However, again with psychosocial supports and including him in the activities of the learning centers and with the inclusion of the school feeding program. This addressed his nutritional needs and Musa'ab's behavior began to transform, notably with improvements in both his academics and his behavior. So these stories can only be attributed to the to the holistic and inclusive nature of the programs. Everyone involved in the program is trained to be accepting of each other, especially through our psychosocial support sessions. The community is also very involved and extremely supportive and participatory. It is this partnership with the community that encourages the sustainability of the program because they are part and par parcel of the program and also take ownership to ensure its success and its sustainability. We are grateful for the partnerships that we currently have with the National, Com the National Commission for Refugees, Migrants and IDPs, as well as the National Commission for People Living with Disabilities. And we are leveraging on that partnership to be able to scale up our programs to, re to reach as many children as possible through our inclusive transitional learning centers. We also partner with the local governments 
areas where the centers are located and extend partnerships to interested stakeholders, donor organizations, and in the spirit of inclusivity, we enjoin and encourage the private sector to uh, contribute as well. So what are our challenges? Their uh, challenges go from funding um, and so we want to make sure that we reach uh, especially uh, children in the area of the agri-vocational programs and partnerships with the government is also very helpful. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Ife. I think what's interesting is how you're talking about a holistic approach and how I think most of the time we forget, and most of us we struggle with this, is how the community, the local community is really the pillar of everything that you do. And I think you touch on the same thing about sustainability that uh, Gilbert was talking about in their project in uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. That it's, it's important when you're thinking to think about sustainability. When you're not here, can your program run? And I know that running a nonprofit, those are challenges we experience all the time, but it's interesting to hear some of the solutions that some of these organizations are implementing to help with sustainability of, of the programs. Um, thank you so much. And uh, let me see who's next on our list. So next we will be heading out to Kenya and we will have uh, Suparna and Maxwell. Uh, from uh, Kilimanjaro Blind Trust, and they'll share with us what they're doing uh, today. Thank you, Irene. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, those who are present here and those who are online. I am very honored to be here today, and I want to thank Zero Project and all those who have helped to recognize our program and our work. I want to, to take a moment to transport you into the world of a young learner with visual impairment in a classroom in Africa. Imagine waking up every day eager to learn and grow, yet surrounded by barriers that seem unsurmountable. Imagine navigating a world where textbooks are inaccessible, where classrooms are crowded, inadequate, and daunting, and dreams seem very far from being able to be reached. About 10,000 children and youth without sight have actually made it to a school or college in just six countries in Africa where we are present and where we work. There are at least 18 to 20,000 others who have not even been able to go to school. I work for Kilimanjaro Blind Trust Africa, and we have made it our business to ensure that those children and youth with visual impairment have access to their education, are able to read and write, and participate in their learning. So Kilimanjaro Blind Trust Africa is a charitable trust. We are based in Nairobi in Kenya, and we work in six countries, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Rwanda, Malawi, and Ethiopia. We are unique in our delivery of an innovative end-to-end -end program that addresses education to employment of those with visual impairment starting at an early age and going through primary, secondary schools, as well as colleges and universities, right to employment. We believe that without access to education, there can be no real inclusion for those with visual impairment. Our programs <clears throat> are based on four strategic pillars. The first one takes care of access to digital literacy and skills through the use of digital braille assistive devices that allow children to read and write and follow their academic program while being able to communicate with their teachers 
and also with those who are sighted. The second program addresses young children with visual impairments in high schools, where we allow them to access STEM subjects and coding and other ICT skills in order to give them a wider career options, because generally without technology, they are unable to really access those uh, kinds of jobs and careers that are in the mainstream today. The third program looks at giving employability skills to young graduates with visual impairments who wish to follow a career and find a job. We support them in a three month program where they learn. We simulate the workplace and they learn from they, they come from nine to five, five days a week, and they learn about being in a mainstream workplace where they learn different skills, including soft skills that allow them to become confident and able to advocate for themselves in the job market. At the same time, we work with private sector or other companies who wish to become inclusive and create a symbiotic relationship by placing our uh, trained graduates as interns in these organizations and supporting the companies and the, the interns to get to know how to manage inclusion in the workplace. And the last one is, is about doing research, supporting research. We work with a partner called Innovate Now, where we provide live lab support that is human-centered testing and feedback for startups in assistive technology. Now, this is a growing market and it's a $3 trillion market worldwide. And for Africa, there is a huge need to develop uh, relevant uh, assistive technology. Yeah, um, so just to continue, um, the reason why we actually drive such a holistic um, intervention basically is to ensure that we promote access to uh, uh, affordable digital braille devices and bridge the gap in terms of access to these devices in sub-Saharan Africa. And also um, um, uh, our unique model works in the sense that we also provide all the services that comes with the provision of assistive devices. For instance, providing user training of these assistive devices and repair and maintenance of these devices as well. Um, and then also uh, we support schools and build their capacity to produce supplementary learning materials in accessible digital formats that work along with these uh, devices that we provide. Um, also, of course, we also provide uh, uh, devices that support access to STEM related subjects in schools and provide mentorship to learners. And um, uh, we also um, uh, use robotics to support learners to learn uh, um, uh, 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 programming languages and other STEM, uh, STEM related subjects. Um, then uh, our track record, of course, uh, over the last years, we've been able to distribute 5,000 plus digital braille devices. We've trained 2,000 plus teachers. We've uh, supported 3,000 plus learners with visual impairment to access digital content. We, our reach is in 200 plus primary and secondary schools. We are currently, uh, we have been able to support 200 plus VA youth in Tibets and train them on digital skills, uh, particularly in cybersecurity and networking, and we are working closely with Cisco Academy. Um, we have trained 60 plus young graduates with visual impairment, and uh, we have placed 80% of them on uh, uh, apprenticeship, and we are currently placing the, the, the rest. Um, then uh, um, our impact over time, we of course have seen improved teacher learner interaction in the classroom because now VA learners have become active learners. Um, we have also um, recorded improved educational outcomes. We have seen increased transition of learners from one level of education to the other. From primary to secondary schools and from secondary schools, we are now seeing increased, increased transition to higher education. Then now uh, we are also seeing employers em embracing um, uh, uh, disability inclusion. Um, so, um, our approach, sustainability approach, of course, is through building the, maintain the assistive devices that we provide, and also um, uh, training the teachers, building the capacity of teachers to train learners on the use of these devices. Uh, we also support schools uh, to produce learning materials, uh, um, uh, accessible learning materials. Um, of course, uh, our call for action uh, is uh, on partnership uh, with um, 
uh, uh, different organization to be able to scale up our interventions across Africa and particularly even in the countries that we're working so that we ensure each and every learner has access to a digital uh, 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 braille device. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Suparna and um, Maxwell. Um, I think one thing that's important that we always we're in the same space. We work with a lot of blind students. They work with a lot of blind students, teachers, and all that good stuff. We are both in technology. We had quite a bit of experience, but it's a bit different. But one thing to note is that Braille is a very important tool for someone or a child who's blind to learn how to read and write. So even for the program that Enable runs, before you come into the assistive technology lab, you need to have your Braille skills because we're not trying to replace Braille. Um, at the same time, it's 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 interesting to see the different types of interventions. We use laptops, iPads, and computers. They're using Braille devices. So, and all these come together to really help with the education of anyone who's blind or anyone who's a child with uh, visual impairment uh, to be able to access education. I think something interesting you talked about is access to content, accessible content. That's a big problem across uh, the continent. Um, it's still something that needs a lot of support, a lot of funding, and even just a lot of skills to be able to develop the right content for the different types of devices that are used in the market. So thank you so much for sharing about your program and congratulations on the work that you're doing. Yeah, great. Okay. Next, we'll come back to Austria and we'll have Johannes share with us some of the work they're doing here. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. I hope I'm not disappointing you when I say I'm not talking about Austria now. So I am from Austria and I know there's still a lot to do in Austria. I will yeah. talk about the program that we're implementing in Kenya, Tanzania, Nigeria, Bangladesh and Nepal. And our innovative practice I want to present is to give organizations of persons with disabilities a central role in our inclusive education work. And that's one of the main trusts of our Inclusive Futures program, which is an inclusive, which is a flagship program funded by the UK government, implemented by a consortium of 11 organizations, some of them focusing on disability and development, some of them not at all, are mainstream development NGOs. And basically, we have two main tasks. One is to test which disability inclusive practices work and do not work in ensuring access for children with disabilities to education, and secondly, to generate solid evidence. Now, organizations of persons with disabilities, giving them a central role throughout the project cycle management, many of you would say, well, that, is that really innovative? We are talking about nothing about us without us for a long time. But I think it's still very innovative and we have looked at many inclusive education projects across the world. And if at all the best organizations of persons with disabilities might be consulted at the beginning of a program, but then the program is implemented and the OPDs never hear about again. So we have taken a different approach. We have invited organizations of persons with disabilities right from the beginning to shape our program. And that is also why the education portfolio became the biggest one in our overall program. Um, and we were very clear that each of our initiatives have to have a very solid engagement plan to engage meaningfully with organizations of persons with disabilities. Unfortunately, um, our friends from OPDs were not able to come to Vienna, um, but we have um, collected the voices in a video that I want to play now, if that works. I think the sound is missing.
continue and then we'll be for some time. And come back to you. Thanks. So he will continue and then let us know when the video is ready. Yeah, I think technology is not on our side. We'll try to fix the video because we don't only we not only want to see our friends from the OPTs, we want also to hear them. Um, but let me move on with the presentation and maybe get to the um, to the video afterwards. So what we have done is kind of make sure that organizations of persons with disabilities are integral partners in the design of our projects. Um, they are members in our governance and steering committees of projects, which means that they are permanently co-decision makers in what we are doing throughout the implementation. They take a very important role in transforming communities, in changing attitudes, creating air awareness in, um, in communities, um, tackling stigma and negative stereotyping. They're working with schools on accessibility, on training of school management committees, teacher, parent, per, teacher, teacher parents associations, um, but also training of teachers where they're involved. Um, and also importantly, they link up to the local government and that has really made a huge difference because suddenly local government authorities kind of are used to listen to the voices of organizations of persons with disabilities and also include them in all different kinds of work, not only in education, but also the important links to health, health and social protection. And of course, they are part and parcel of monitoring, evaluation and learning because we want to make sure that their voices, their experiences are also heard when we think about how our programs are moving on. Now, what difference it has made? So first of all, um, they present an authentic voice. They are being present. They have powerful messages. And I remember one OPD representative saying in one of our um, meetings, well, I know what I have experienced when I was going to school in a mainstream setting and I experienced the barriers and I can help to avoid these barriers being repeated now. Um, they also make clear inclusive education and disability inclusion is not a vision. It's not a far away thing that we try to settle when everything else in the education sector is being um, solved. It is an urgency. It's about including children with disabilities now because it's now the time for their education and not in 10 or 20 years. They managed to get a much stronger outreach to children with multiple and complex disabilities who are very often left out completely from education because many people think they are not fit to kind of join a mainstream education setting and they are represented in local decision making which is so important for sustainability if we would rely only on us talking to the local government and the project ends that dialogue ends but if we have created sustainable links to the organizations of persons with disabilities in the area they will continue to talk to the government and to fight and demand their rights and they are really a kind of force to help to address the question and we asked how to make inclusive education possible and not at least they are critical friends um, for us when we go through implementation and kind of point us to areas where we might miss out on things that are extremely important for them. So what is it that makes this engagement possible because it's not around um, it's not happened by itself. It's not by calling out to OPDs and saying, please join us, that they will turn up. It needs an active outreach um, to get them on board and especially look at the diversity of representation so that not groups that are often left behind, like um, people with deaf blindness, with intellectual um, impairments and so on, are kind of not included. What is important, and that is the result of a conversation of OPD members with the project managers we had in all our five countries. It's important that we agree on shared vision and values. 
that power is shared, that leadership is shared, that there is clear decision on the roles and responsibilities so that we can know who is expecting what from whom. Um, also, it's important to dedicate resources and budgets. It's not just um, kind of saying you come on a voluntary basis. That's not possible for most of the OPDs. If they are participants in the program, they are taking on actions, they have the right for a fair remuneration and getting the resources they need to contribute meaningfully to the project. And we have to respect that they are expert organizations and they, we identify together their strengths and weaknesses and our strengths and weaknesses as NGOs and as governments in the area. And that creates a mutual accountability and a mutual respect that's so important. And finally, each stakeholder in this project need to be prepared for transformation and learning. There are nice concepts out, but then when the concept hits the ground, that is where we have to adapt to learn and transform. And I can just say, and one of the OPD voices in the video is saying that without involving OPDs, we are not reaching what we want to achieve and we are not getting the impact we can get and we are not sustaining our work. Thank you. I think we're doing great on time, so I'm going to see if we can get like two minutes to show his video, if that's OK. I think they have to do it. So can I, yeah, yeah. Nope. Nope. So we'll give you a bit more time. Don't worry, you can try it if it comes back. So thank you. Um, our tech team has really tried and they will continue to try. If not, we'll be able to share the video uh, online. Um, next, we are going to go to Nigeria and Marvel will share with us about how they are providing ICT skills to girls and women. Uh, and I think before we go there, I definitely wanted to uh, commend uh, Johannes for raising the issue of complex disabilities. I think um, just based on my experience, and I know it varies, there's a tendency to mainly focus on the blind, the deaf, and those with physical uh, disabilities. But it's important that we create awareness about other types of disabilities so that at least we are more inclusive in the same space as well. And um, something important that you also raised is the issue of uh, DPOs. It's also important to engage DPOs, but the reality is that there's a role for each and every one of, of us to play. I always say disability is very complex. You cannot do it alone. So let's identify what roles are played by the government, by private sector, by DPOs, and let's come together and collaborate. So thank you for bringing out those um, critical points on complex disabilities and DPO engagement, because it does make a difference. And it's important that we have a diversity when it comes to disabilities. So I'll go ahead and hand over to Maveli to share with us more information about what they're doing in Nigeria. Hello, everyone. 
It's a huge pleasure for me to be here today and um, I'm really, really honored to have been recognized by the Zero Project. My project has been awarded and um, I'm very grateful. Um, I want to tell you a secret. Writing this speech brought back bittersweet memories. Bitter because up until now, more than 5 million women and girls, particularly those with disabilities in Nigeria, my country, still are marginalized, do not have access to technology, lack skills and support to break the shackles of extreme poverty in which they find themselves. Sweet because of how far I've come with this initiative. My name is Marvela Odili. I am the founder and CEO of Save Our Needy Organization, a non-profit and non-governmental organization. For more than 10 years, I have been working actively to end extreme poverty, gender inequality, and reduce inequalities in Africa, particularly focusing on women and girls. I've been working for a more inclusive and just world. We've all heard of poverty. Well, have we heard about extreme poverty and the effects that it has on women and girls? Do you know that extreme poverty can lead to depression and mental disability? In 2018, I launched Project Empower. I launched it to strengthen the capacity of marginalized women and girls, women and girls living in extreme poverty, living with disabilities, living with HIV, and survivors of gender-based violence. I wanted them to be able to earn a sustainable income and break free from extreme poverty using technology and innovative communication methods. Through my initiative, women and girls become financially independent. They change their mindset from a mindset of victims to a mindset of leaders, and they begin to lead more productive lives through training, in-person and online training, and psychosocial support and mentorship. Women and girls are trained. Yeah. <laughs> Women and girls are trained on digital skills, entrepreneurship, and leadership development. They learn to use technology for research, marketing, and to earn a sustainable income. Yes, I have faced challenges during this project. There have been challenges of people not taking mental disability as serious as physical disability. There have also been challenges of uh, negative attitude to women and girls living with disabilities. Also, I've had challenges with funding, but I have tried to overcome all these challenges. My, my project takes an innovative approach, which is that the project is focused on women and girls. They are the drivers of change and the champions of this project. And I do not only focus on training these women and girls who are marginalized on developing skills to earn a sustainable income. I also focus on their mindset, working on their mindset through mentorship support, through all kinds of support to be able to move from victims to leaders. I have a lot of success stories, but these particular stories hit a nerve. There is a story of Fumbi, who is 28, a secondary school leaver, that means she did not go to university, and the mother of three young children, all below the ages of five. Fumbi suffered domestic violence for several years from her partner, and this took a toll on her mental health. But because she lacked skills and support, she lived from hand to mouth, and she was unable to leave her partner. She never could muster the courage to leave. Through this project, she developed skills, she got empowered, and she has been able to improve her employability. Now she works for a big IT firm. She earns enough to take care of herself and her children. And believe it or not, Fumbi has finally left her abusive partner. Adeshola is another success story. Adeshola is an adolescent who was raped at a very tender age but she was never able to speak out. 
because we have this culture of silence in Nigeria, Africa, and this greatly affected her mental health. This initiative provided Adeshola with a safe space to be able to freely speak out about her issues. She was able to speak out. She got psychosocial support. She got mentorship support from this initiative. And she was also able to gain skills. Today, Adeshola is a very happy girl and she has been able to empower other girls in her community. Beneficiaries of Project Empower empower others in their communities thereby creating a multiplier effect, which leads to sustainability. From this initiative, I have learned that empowering marginalized women and girls has a re ripple effect on their families and their communities. And this leads to economic change. Women and girls can actually change the world. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you so much, Mavel, for taking us through some of the work that you're doing. Yes. It's very inspiring to know that you started the program and you've gone through everything on this planet to make sure that it succeeds. I have a bit of that experience and halfway through you feel like you're going to give up and then another door opens. So keep going. And I think um, what's interesting is that you have such a huge focus on empowerment and that's what she's using as a multiplier effect because if you empower one girl she'll empower the next one and the next one and that's how you change a community but that's all that's also what's your sustainability which is amazing so thank you so much for walking us through that and of course the power of women and girls in the community and of course there's a different set of challenges that just being a woman with a disability or a girl with a disability that you experience um, just because you have a disability so uh, of course that's another conversation but um, interesting that you're working in that space so now because I think how are we doing on time how are we doing on time we're good excellent so I think what we'll do is um, we'll open up for questions in case anyone has questions and then we'll get back to to everybody else on the panel to for some additional questions yes Chris please go ahead thank you nice to see you nice to see you too Irene. yeah um so unfortunately, my assistive technology is not powerful enough to read the names of the, the women sitting at the end, but um, both of you mentioned psychosocial support as part of your interventions. Um, we recently launched a project uh, providing psychosocial support for uh, students with disabilities. Um, and so just interested if you could share a little bit more about what the scope of those interventions are, um, and uh, how they've been received and sort of what your learnings, uh, if any, have been uh, through that. Should I go? Yeah, please. Okay. Okay, so um, like, I, like I mentioned, we um, are interventions are education interventions, and we deal with uh, children from the early years up to um, uh, young adults. So the psychosocial support uh, systems that we use, especially for the much younger children, are activity based so that it's not the children having to come and sit for a session or mm -hmm. it's more activity based. So the children don't even realize that they are undergoing a psychosocial support. But it's really very important because the, the because of the nature of the work we do, working with uh, children in display settings who have um, experienced different kinds of trauma that mm -hmm. no child should have to deal with. And that's what leads to some of the learning disabilities that they do have. We have seen a lot of uh, progress in their academics, in their mm -hmm. interactions with other children, interactions with adults. And so a lot of times with these supports, times where they can't speak about what they're experiencing, uh, times where they have um, what I've now come to know as invisible disabilities, through these sessions, they are able to uh, either talk about them or realize I'm not the only one who's going through this. Um, there are other people like this and it doesn't have to be a life sentence. So that's the that's the progress we've seen with the psychosocial support. Okay. Mavrel, you want to go next? 
Well, for Save Our Needy Organization, we engage counselors um, who engage these people, the women and the girls, talk to them in a very friendly way, and become friends with them. So uh, without them even knowing, they're able to reveal things that they never could tell anyone before. They are able to speak up, become friends with these counselors who just act like friends and not really professionals. And so they're able to get all this information from them and know how to help. So that's how we go about it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. No, thank you so much for that. Um, from our experience at Enable, um, on a regular day, we have about a thousand blind students in our program. And what I hear from my team all the time is the way sometimes they feel like they are therapists simply because the kids are dealing with so much. Let me give you a simple example. We've had experiences where the first time a student touches a laptop or a keyboard, they cry. They're scared. They're frightened. It can take you two months for that child to really get accustomed. Yeah. So, so you find you always have to find tactics and solutions of how to really get through to the child. And something that I know is, is very, very important is about making sure that we are providing this psychosocial support from a very tender age. Because most of the time what we happen to do is we wait until people are teenagers and then we come in with the interventions. So when you start early, it, it definitely makes a big difference. But also something interesting that Ife mentioned is the idea of um, not letting, yeah, the activity-based therapy where a child does, is not even aware you're giving them therapy. That is very, very important because you don't want the child to shut down, but also it becomes a regular engagement. One that I've seen that's also very interesting is training older people, like grandmothers. So when kids see an older person, you're not my parent, you're not going to discipline me. But if it's a grandmother, they say anything to grandmothers. So that's another strategy that really can work in terms of how do you penetrate the kids? Because if you if a child goes through good therapy, they are, you're able to break through, then you can empower them, you can inspire them, and they can become an example to another child, but even just transform their own life. So, so thank you for that. I think that was a great question, Chris. Excellent. Anyone else? Yes, please. Um, I've got a question specifically for Johannes. Um, I mean, I, I mean, it's great presentation, but inevitably it was quite high level. It would be really, I think, it'd be really interesting if you could identify a specific barrier to op OPD participation in a particular project, and 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 how that was overcome. Yes, <clears throat> thank you for the question. Um, I think one, one barrier is that kind of when you when you reach out to OPDs in a project area, so you're you're kind of starting your intervention in a certain setting with schools and so on, and you're looking who is there, who are the local OPDs there and so on, they are not necessarily kind of very much champions of education right from the beginning. They might have many other priorities and and just to say we are often our projects are often in very poor settings. So one of the first priorities for them is how do we sustain the life of our families and have income and 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 get something some something to eat basically get access to health and so on. And you are coming and saying, well, we invite you to join an education project. Um, they would probably say yes, because it creates some opportunities for them. But I have also been in schools and you meet the parents of, of the kids and the OPD representatives. And they say, yes, it's great to see the school is now more welcoming for my kids. But please, can you tell us how we get more access to livelihood, how we can get the health intervention for my kid? So I think that's a challenge also also for the, let's say, this fragmentation of the sectors. So we often have programs in education or health or any other thing or livelihood. But for a family, that's all part of the same story. It's not they are not living their life according to sectoral programs. And I think to kind of find ways to address it in the program, and we have managed that by 
creating links to social protection systems, to provision of assistive devices, to getting health camps and screenings and so on. But that was definitely and still is a challenge, one of them, I would say. Excellent, thank you. As you're speaking, you've just reminded me of, I think if uh, you spoke about inclusive inclusion, having children with disabilities together with those without disabilities, which is very, very critical. And um, I remembered an experience we recently had in Kenya. Um, Enable built this amazing library in a village uh, for the entire community. And uh, during the holiday season in November and December, because schools are closed, we had over 500 students registered to come in just to have uh, digital skills training on a daily basis. And then we had about 40 students with disabilities. But when we started off, when we asked the community where students with disabilities, they were nowhere to be found. There was only one or two, even the churches, maybe there's one because they are hidden. But um, we worked with uh, the county government, the special education, and we started making phone calls. What was interesting is that every time we made a phone call, and let's say I call du Duboisi. I call Duboisi, I say, hey Duboisi, I'm calling about your son, Maxwell. And we'd like him to come in and learn digital skills here at the Digital Hub. The first thing Duboisi would say, are you talking about Maxwell or are you talking about John? And we're like, no, we're talking about Maxwell. Why? Because Maxwell has a disability, John doesn't. So they always think that parents also just think that Kids, uh, the child without a disability is the one who needs to excel. So those are challenges we experienced and we had to find a way to maneuver to a point we had to provide transportation for these young students to come. But it was such a huge um, life changing experience for the parents because I had a chance to meet with the parents and to talk. They said they never thought in their wildest dreams that their students in the village with disabilities would actually even have such a chance. So. There are various ways we face challenges, but we have to continue being inclusive and trying to figure out how we can engage everyone. Yes. Please proceed. Yes. Um, well, I see a lot of parallels between Africa and Asia mm -hmm. per se and South America. Because what I observe is for children with disabilities, specifically for the girl child, they are marginalized, not just educationally, but even culturally and socially and economically. We see that they are disempowered in all these aspects. In India, a girl child with disabled, a girl child itself, they, they neglect for the education. For a disabled girl child, till third standard, fourth standard, that is what is the default, de facto application. So, we social activists, social political activists, we look at education as a liberating tool, not just yeah. getting through to uh, passing one 10 standard or something. So we look at it as a liberating tool. There are, in fact, there are places where the government, government per se accepts it, but there are government players who will not encourage it. So okay, if you can also tell your do you have such parallel situation in Africa? And how did you address it if you did so, please? That we'd really like to know. Uh, let me go to my right. Anyone open to answering the question? Yes, I, I think that, yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right that the conditions are very similar because of the um, socioeconomic status of those who are suffering from uh, any kind of uh, disability. And I think that it's very important, as you say, that education is is actually the the tool that will empower them to live different lives. And And we definitely believe in that. And so it's about how do you, address stigma because there is a lot of stigma in in on the african continent around um disability how do you give value to a child who has a different ability by educating them and showing the results of how this child can grow up and contribute to the economic status of the family the community and the country and i think that that is what all of us together that we are fighting for disability, inclusion, 
we can prove to the world and to, to communities around uh, our different continents that um, it is important to educate because that is going to be the, 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 the glue that will, you know, bring solutions. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I was just looking at, um, because this is a conversation I've had with the uh, uh, um, individuals from other parts of, of the continent in Africa, especially looking at uh, our government system, and Irene, you will agree with me, um, we have representation of persons with disabilities in um, um, in the two legislative assemblies, both the national uh, the national assembly and and the senate. So the reason why that was anchored in the in the, in the new constitution, while it's no longer new, was that they championed for the interest and the rights of persons with disabilities, not just uh, at policy level, but even in terms of access to basic amenities like basic, like education, healthcare, and so on and so forth. So I think that already set a foundation in the Kenyan context in terms of having persons with disabilities getting involved, um, uh, uh, for example, in access to education and all that. Yes, uh, we do accept the stigma is still there and stigma is real uh, in Kenya and in the larger African continent. But again, as Spana said, um, having those who have been successful in, for instance, in education, in business and all that, and by that I mean persons with disabilities, coming out and, um, you know, a, a community seeing that indeed persons with disabilities also have that potential um, is also a, a better way of, um, uh, of championing for uh, inclusion of persons with disabilities. Uh, thank you. Uh, one last question and then we go to Gil back. Yes, please. Hi, it's Edward Winter from World Vision. Um, so thank you for the great presentations, really exciting. One of, I can't remember, I think it was uh, the Kilimanjaro Blind Trust mentioned the, the challenge around accessible resources. So I just wanted to sort of um, let people know, so World Vision has been supporting the Bloom uh, platform to make that more accessible. So any materials that are developed in that platform should be accessible for Braille readers. Um, you can input sign language um, videos in there as well. So I'd encourage you to use that platform. So it's bloomlibrary.org, or you can contact me if you're having issues um, getting that. We've also been working on a uh, um, a coaching tool to ensure inclusivity and in, in delivery of education systems at ECD all the way up to, to secondary level. Um, and the final thing would be to encourage you to people interested to enjoy the um, join the inclusive EdTech working group. Um, they've done a that they I think they're currently doing the uh, a presentation, but it's a fireside chat. But that's going to be a great mechanism for people to share available resources. Um, across, I know because there's several platforms and etc. You know, Benetech um, is actually facilitating that group, um, but I hope that that will lead to greater access to some materials. Thanks. Okay, fantastic. We are almost coming to the end, but I definitely want to give Gilbert a chance to say anything he needs to say, but he can also tell us um, about what's most important to him in terms of what they're doing on their program when it comes to engagement. I believe firmly that the first rehabilitation for children with disability is the acceptance in the family. Then this attitude, when it is unlocked, then the possibility to gain other opportunities will be coming. That's why even in my challenging context like Congo, it is important to believe a kind of joint effort based on a family level, that is a fundamental, on a community level, but still believing on the state's contribution, even if it is very challenging context, then we as NGO, we could play the role of supporting, strengthening family and state level. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I'll start from Suparna all the way this way. You have 30 seconds for you have 30 seconds for a quick wrap up. 
Thanks, Irene. I just want to say that it is so important for us more and more to work together because many of us are having overlapping uh, work that we do to address the, di the difficulties and the challenges that are out there. And I think that the only way that we can we can succeed in attaining um, scale is by working together. And so I invite anyone who would like to work with us or think that we can work with them, we would be very, very happy. Thank you. Maxwell, 30 seconds. Yes, so um, because I know the room is full of innovators and um, as we said earlier on, we provide, um, uh, we support uh, innovators who develop AT products um, through uh, um, human centered user testing. I uh, would be happy to work with you, whether you're in the global north or global south, to provide human centered uh, testing of your innovations with persons with disabilities and um, we can always uh, engage. Thank you. Yeah, just to say apologies that the video did not work. It did in the testing, but not in the live performance. But all presentations will be uploaded on the web page. So I um, strongly suggest you look at the upload because the video is really strong. These voices are much powerful than my voice and they're really great. And if you want to talk to me, please see me um, about our experience of working with organizations of persons with disabilities. Yeah, I will say thank you very much for this opportunity and um, I will reiterate that um, empowerment is the key to breaking free from extreme poverty. Um, achieving a world with zero barriers um, requires collective efforts. So I'll be very, very open to working with any organization or individual who has heard about my project and is very interested in whatever I'm doing. Thank you very much in advance. Um, it's uh, It's been a wonderful um, experience coming here. And um, what I would love to do is to collaborate with organizations that are interested in furthering our cause. The example of the little boy I talked about, who's in a wheelchair right now. Unfortunately, he's in a wheelchair that isn't his size. And so those are some of the challenges we have with assistive technology that we really need support with, especially because we're working in very rural and remote areas where these things are not available. So we are available afterwards for any organizations who are interested in working with us and supporting the work that we do. Thank you. So thank you so much to this amazing team of experts from different parts of the world and for showcasing what sub-Saharan Africa has. I think what's most important, my takeaway, and I hope, I'm sure everyone else has learned something, is the importance of government, the importance of taking a holistic approach, the importance of family, the importance of women and engagement and government, and most importantly, how we can come together to create sustainable program. Last but not least, Enable hosts the Inclusive Africa Conference, the largest disability conference in Africa. It's coming up on May 14th through the 16th. So you can join us virtually or you can come in person to learn more about our programs and what's going on across Africa. Thank you so much to Zero Project and the entire Zero Project team and our digital team for supporting us. And I'll hand over to this lady here. Thank you. Yes, uh, my name is Petra. I will just give those of you who just walked in <laughs> and those of you who've been here for a while um, a very quick summary of things that I listened to that I heard, which could be take out, adding up to what yours already summed up. Mm -hmm. um, there were five projects being presented, focusing on sub-Saharan Africa, um, comprehensive teaching frameworks. And the first one, uh, Congo, I picked out one of the learnings was that it, as, a, as an NPO, you don't only fund projects, but you also support governments and mm -hmm. uh, communities to do projects, especially I think you also mentioned when situations are unstable and then create strength within the community and within um, the state and also make sure that the policies make sure that 
B, all have a place. So all people must, and of course we're talking about children with people, disabilities um, in, in, in the main focus. Um, yeah, and then we moved, we had a lot of uh, moving around <laughs> Sub-Saharan <laughs> Africa, um, and we heard about safe spaces, holistic, uh, inclusive environment where children and young people and teachers, both with and without disabilities, feel safe so they can learn something. Um, they get psychological support, but also social support. I heard about um, providing food as an example because uh, many children have lack of nutrition. And we heard three different success stories, um, one being the young man who was traumatized by his accident, accident, but then turned out to be empowered and strong and can live his life now. Um, then we heard about, uh, let me see, <laughs> barriers that can be removed. In this case, particularly for blind and visually impaired children, um, the barriers would be texts that are not accessible, crowded classrooms where you don't feel comfortable. And um, the solutions are, digital um, access to content and then supporting the children to go to high school so they can go into higher education and also learn job skills, being in a job from nine to five, something you have to learn. There's a lot of skills you need, but you also provide research so that those who work know what to do. Mm. Um, and I think the, the main part also you talked about was the Braille. So you're focusing on Braille, um, Braille technologies, so that blind children, blind people can access um, all the technology, all the information. And um, it's from primary school to secondary school to university and to work. That's the impact you had. You can see a lot of stories of people who have this success. Uh, fourth uh, project was about nothing about us without us, but really, like really, really in every aspect of the way, not only in the de development part, mm. uh, but um, on the implementation, on monitoring, on local decision making. So having people with, uh, with disabilities involved in every step of the way, talking about inclusive education. And it's um, focused on uh, disabled persons organizations, making sure that they really walk their talk. That, I think that's the message. Last but not least, women and girls can change the world. Isn't exactly. that true? <laughs> can we please give an applause to that? <laughs> um, and ne uh, nonetheless, it's important to see that many women in, in these programs uh, in Nigeria, girls and women have suffered from trauma, are being victimized, and the program supports the transformation from victim to leadership so that with all the skills you get, you can be a leader and a strong woman in the community. That's my last part. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much for the design, the drawing, the art, artistic, uh, the creativity that's uh, behind that and for listening to everything we had to share. So last but not least, I want to thank each one of you for coming here, for having faith in us, for taking time to listen and for participating. And we hope you can continue to learn more about these organizations and the work they continue to do. Thank you so much and have a wonderful rest of the conference. Thanks.